substitution and elimination reactions. In substitution, one functional group is exchanged for another. Your reagent is a nucleophile. So substitution requires a minimum of two mechanistic steps. It has to have loss of a leaving group and it has to have nucleophilic attack. The nucleophilic attack is what puts the Y on your carbon-carbon backbone and the loss of the leaving group is what gives you the X anion. So, we exchange one functional group for another, the reagent is a nucleophile, and it involves loss of a leaving group and nucleophilic attack. Now, those can happen sequentially, or they can happen at the same time. If it's sequential, we call it SN1. The S stands for substitution, the N stands for nucleophilic, and the 1 because the rate limiting step is unimolecular. If you go concerted, it's SN2. Nucleophilic substitution bimolecular. So in an SN1 reaction, it's sequential, so your two steps happen in sequence. The first step that's rate limiting is loss of the leaving group. This forms a carbocation. The second step is nucleophilic attack. So, for instance, in our first step, our 2-bromo-2-methylpropane, we have loss of a leaving group here. This generates a bromide ion. Remember, there were three lone pairs on the bromine to begin with. And a carbocation. Just for some terminology here, the alkyl halide is our substrate, and the carbocation is an intermediate. Our second step will be nucleophilic attack, which may or may not be reversible, depending on my nucleophile. So my nucleophile attacks the carbocation to give us our substitution product. And the leaving group, in this case the bromide, is also a product because it wasn't used in the second step. Since the loss of the leaving group to form the carbocation is the so step, the rate of the reaction R equals a rate constant times the concentration of the substrate. It's first order and thus it's unimolecular. And that's why this is SN1. SN2 reactions have one step that contains both nuke attack and loss of the leaving group. SN2 reactions also include inversion of configuration. So, C 
say we had this molecule, S2-bromobutane, and we react it with sodium chloride. The chloride ion is a strong nucleophile. It attacks the alpha carbon of the alkyl halide, and we get loss of a leaving group. So, curved arrow 1 represents nuke attack, and curved arrow 2 represents loss of a leaving group. And so for our products, we'll get the leaving group, the bromide ion, and we'll also get 2-chlorobutane, but the chloride had to attack from the backside, so we get an inversion of configuration. and we get R to chlorobutane. Here, our rate limiting step is bimolecular. It depends on the concentration of both the substrate So R equals K times the concentration of substrate times the concentration of our nucleophile. That's bimolecular. Which is why we have SN2. In an elimination reaction, Our reagent is a base. Our substrate may still be an alkyl halide. They make great uh, substrates for this. And our products will be a leaving group. Well, let's just draw it like this. And an alkene. What we're really eliminating is one of these beta protons and the leaving group. That means both of our alpha carbon and our beta carbon only have three bonds. So, to give them a fourth, we put in that pi bond. And it's actually the pair of electrons that bind the beta proton that becomes the pi bond. Just as substitution requires loss of a leaving group and nucleophilic attack, elimination requires two mechanistic steps as well. You need loss of a leaving group and proton transfer. Right, and so it's the proton transfer that requires the base as the reagent. Moreover, these two steps can occur sequentially or concerted.
The E1 mechanism is sequential. Step 1 is loss of a leaving group. And step 2 is proton transfer. So for instance, if I have my 2-bromo 2-methyl propane, first step will be loss of a leaving group. We get our bromide ion and our carbocation. So far, this looks just like the first step of the SN1 mechanism. Because mechanistically it is the same. It's loss of a leaving group. Where things diverge from the SN1 mechanism is that our reagent in the second step must be a base to accomplish the proton transfer. And the base is going to take one of the beta protons. So a proton attached to a carbon that's adjacent to the carbocation. So say it takes this one. Now, this pair of electrons has to go somewhere and it's going to become the pi bond. Like so. giving us our product, an alkene, and we also get the conjugate acid. So, we had an alkyl halide substrate, a carbocation intermediate, and an alkene product. The rate limiting step again is the formation of the carbocation at step one. It's unimolecular. Rate just equals the constant times the concentration of the substrate. That's why it's E1. An E2 mechanism is concerted and it has one step that's both proton transfer and loss of a leaving group. We could have the same tertiary alkyl halide substrate and we react it with our base those two curved arrows represent proton transfer but the formation of this pi bond here exceeds the octet on the alpha carbon and so we have to have loss of a leaving group as well. So this curved arrow in blue represents loss of a leaving group. As for products, we get our leaving group, in this case bromide, and we get the conjugate acid, and we get the alkene. Because this step involves two molecules, both the base and the substrate, the rate law is bimolecular, and it equals the constant times the concentration of the substrate times the concentration of the base. Bimolecular, E2.